Welcome to GRE Snacks, snackable episodes about the GRE exam and graduate school admissions. I'm Tyler, the founder of Achievable, and we have an affordable GRE course that includes everything you need to ace your GRE exam. A full textbook, tons of questions that are backed by our memory enhancing algorithm, and full length practice exams. You can try it out for free at achievable.me, and if you like it, the code podcast gets you 10% off at checkout. Now, let's get started. Hillary Schubach is with us today in, from Shine Admissions. Hillary, I'd love if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Well, thank you. So I'm Hillary Schubach. I run a company called Shine MBA Admissions Consulting, or Shine Admissions for short. And I work with aspiring grad students and uh, especially business school students who want to develop extraordinary applications and get accepted to the schools of their choice. Great. Yeah. And today we're going to be talking about one part of the application that's super fun, which is how do you know if your GRE or GMAT test score is good enough? And then what do you do if it isn't? <laughs> so let's, let's start with the first one, right? How do you know? Um, what, what's the best way to kind of look this up? Well, this is the first question most people ask me when they meet me and set up a consultation. You know, is my score good enough? What do I have to aim for? What should I aim for? Which is often a way of saying, you know, what's the lowest score I can get away with and then move on from the testing portion of the admissions process. So uh, I'm happy to ground you with a, a little case study here. So Wharton Business School, MBA, class of 2024. Let's look at the GRE range for a minute. Okay, so the range is the lowest score that they accepted in the class and the highest Mm -hmm. so the top to the bottom so the quant uh, lowest score the range of quant was 146 and then the high end was 170 right which is perfect one yeah and the verbal is 143 170 Um, both of those have a median of 162 so you know just to give you a sense okay like, that's great. So maybe I could get into Wharton, one of the top schools in the world, with a 146 quant and a 143 verbal. And my answer is, that's not really a great strategy to aim for the lowest score that you can see was ever accepted in that class. And, and you know, consider that your best effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's much more important when you can find this information to look into the middle 80% rate. Um, it's, it's, this is the measure that a lot of schools more and more are publishing, both for GRE, GMAT, and whatever tests they may accept, where they're showing not just the entire full range of accepted scores, but the middle 80%. In other words, they've lopped off the bottom 10% and lopped off the top 10%. So if you look at the center, mm-hmm. now you see a much more concise set of scores to aim for. Uh, excluding the outliers. So now, um, you know, Wharton didn't happen to publish their 80% range, but Yale School of Management, which is another fantastic school, did publish theirs. And mm-hmm. theirs is 160 to 170 for quant, 159 for 169 to verbal. So the top is kind of similar. There are a lot of people achieving those top scores on the GRE, but uh, the the low end is a lot higher than it seemed right. when you look at the full range. Well, because you're cutting off the tails, right? Like, and everybody who's falling into that, like, really low range, like under a 160, um, there's, there's, like, something going on there, right? Maybe they come from a, a background that, you know, this school really wanted. Maybe they um, have some... Maybe they have like a special like skill or specialty that the school's really interested in. Maybe they got an amazing quant score and their verbal score was just really bad, but they happen to be that low of a ver- like you only see one side of it, right? So it's it's a very um yeah it, I think it's very wise to not <laughs> rely on the whole range and instead kind of use that eighty percent range if you can. Yeah, and even with the eighty percent range in your, you know, in your crosshairs. I'm still going to say now, do you want to aim for the very bottom or do you want to aim as high as you possibly can? 
So recognizing that 80% of the class falls between, let's just use Vermont for simplicity. So for Yale, uh, 160 to 170 is where 80% of the class lies. So if you've got a 159, does that mean you have no chance of getting in? No. 10% of the class got below a 160 on quant and they got in. Uh, to your very important point, Tyler, it does not, you know, the score alone doesn't reflect their quant profile otherwise. So this person could have a CFA, work for a top investment bank, and have been a finance statistics major. So, you know, hence, this is a holistic process and the score is not everything, but I really encourage people to uh, aim for as high within the range, if not higher, that they possibly can achieve but recognize that at least if you're in that range, you know, you're somewhere within that middle of the range, you know, the median of Yale's class for quant is, what, is 166. So within that range is 160 to 170. The median is 166. So if you can aim as high as possible, you know, that's going to set you up for the most competitive position. Efficiency does not come down only to test scores. But right. it is still a meaningful and important part of the process. And there's no benefit to leaving any points on the table. Well, and there's just no, there's no reason to not get that score that you need, right? Like, and I know that, like, there's lots of reasons why it's hard. I'm not trying to say that, you know, and everybody should get a 166 because, and if you don't, you just aren't, you know, you're a failure. Like there's lots of lots of real life reasons why it's hard to get a 166, right? But the if your dream is to go to Yale, like that should be a cornerstone of like what you're doing to get there. I feel like um, because if you go in like and you do everything else right, but you roll in with a 156 instead of a 166, you just your chances are a lot lower, and you're you're doing yourself a disservice to all the other work that you're doing. Yes, I mean, I think we all can empathize with how unpleasant this experience is. No offense to my beloved test prep friends, but it's not fun. And I say this with, mm-hmm. you know, with full empathy. I've been there. You know, I went through the whole thing too. I went to business school. I get it. It's the worst. But at least everybody has to do it. So you're not alone. That's the good news. But uh, you just, it's not worth leaving points on the table. So that's part of your assessment ultimately. So now you've taken the test. And you got your score, and now trying to assess whether it's good enough. You know, you have to take into consideration how that score fits into the context of your entire quantitative and academic and professional profile. Right. Let's talk about that event if you like. Yeah, sure. Go for it. So let's say you're that person at the top bank with the finance stats focus in college, with the CFA, all of that then is there a little less pressure for you to get the top score in quant that you possibly, you know, that that was possibly ever accepted at Yale? No. No, they might have a bit of forgiveness for you, perhaps a strong test taker, but you have demonstrated these abilities in other aspects of your profile. So, you know, taking that into consideration, you know, have you proven your quantitative or verbal analytical competency elsewhere? And if so, then you know you might be okay if your score is slightly lower than your hope than your you would hope. Um, if your let's say it's quant versus verbal, and your total score is really getting pulled down by the verbal, but you know your quantitative score is really high, and it's and you're applying to business school where we know that the quantitative aspect is pretty important, mm. so you might be okay. So if it's a verbal problem, it's really okay, but quantitative. If it's does need to be demonstrated. Right. And then the other key piece, which you know you spoke to as that, it's like, have you studied your fullest potential? If yep. you're targeting a top school and or you are a top highly driven candidate who is gunning for the best school they could possibly get into, then there's no good reason not to maximize this test prep process and study your fullest potential. And then whatever score you end up getting, if you can look at yourself and say, I've done everything possible to get that score and feel good about that, then you're good. Because then, you know, that's who you are. And that's okay. And then you could talk about what to do about it, you know, if it's not good enough, but at least you know you've given it everything. 
And then the other piece to consider too is maybe you've studied your fullest potential and you've scored higher in practices, but then just something happened on test day, you just had an off day or hit some traffic or had things on your mind and, and you know you just left some low hanging fruit easy points on there and you know you just had a, you went back and took it tomorrow and you know you'd get them, then go back and do that. Mm -hmm. So think about how much effort you've put in, think about your performance to this point in your practices. And then ultimately, show good professional judgment. Uh, if you've taken the test three times, four times, it's enough. I mean, no grad school wants you to spend all of your life's energy retaking an exam and hitting your head against the wall when you could be out there doing meaningful things and having a positive impact on the world or volunteering or doing well in your job. Just take it in stride, do your very best, and then move on to the other elements. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, you you put what I was trying to say really well, which is like just that you should want to score to your, your full potential if, and do everything you can to do that. Um, I am curious then, the other part of this topic was what do you do if you didn't get the score that you need, right? So what are some tips that you have for your clients when they're you know, looking at sort of like a five or even a 10 point gap between what they're aiming for and kind of where they're at. Great question. We've um, really done some digging into this with admissions officers. And again, I'll use the business school admissions process as um, my, my lead here because it's a pretty hardcore admissions process. And so I think it's safe to say that across the board, uh, they would all agree that the most valuable thing you can do is if you really are far off the mark, like off the mark, where it's a really, it's possibly a deal breaker level of a gap, then consider switching exams if mm -hmm. your school accepts multiple exams. So GMAT, GRE, and executive assessment are three exams that business schools uh, accept now, depending on which school executive assessment may or may not be accepted. But GMAT and GRE are pretty universally accepted. About 30% or so mm -hmm. of business school candidates take the GRE and the rest take GMAT. But it is 100% okay with admissions officers to submit either one. They don't care. It, they're basically saying, help us help you. Let us accept you. And we want to accept you. Don't let your score derail you. So they just want you to submit the score that you that will enable you to perform the best. Mm. By the way, if you're not sure which one that is before you go into the process in the first place, take a sample test. Go on the ETS and GMAC website and take a sample test. They're free. You can try out the different formats. GMAC is just about to switch formats, though, so don't get too excited about what you see today. Um, more on that on their website. But you, if you perform better on one test versus another, great. That's the one you take. Mm -hmm. So switch exams as priority one and get at least a passable score that's not going to completely derail your fantasy. Right. From there, though, there are some things you can do. Yeah, no, so um, my, my just quick chip in before going on to from there, uh, there are things you can do, which I definitely want to follow up on, uh, is don't take a 20-question diagnostic and, dear God, do not take a, a diagnostic test that includes problems from both. These things don't work. You have to take a full, honest-to-goodness practice test with each of them. And yes, it takes three or four hours, but also you're about to spend, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars and probably hundreds of hours preparing for the test. So you should really spend this time investment at the beginning to make sure you're taking the right one. Um, anyway, that's my rant. Thank you for listening. Yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, it's, it's a huge investment just like business school and graduate school is. So the time you spend getting to know your programs, you should spend as you have the investment of preparing for this exam. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if you're, you know, if you have a coach or a test prep program helping you, you know, you need to do that right one as well. So all of that matters. Um, but let's say you've now maxed out your test. You have maxed that out to your fullest potential and you've picked the right exam, et cetera. It's done. But You've now got a score that you still feel is really reflecting your capabilities and you're not happy. And you don't feel that you have proven these competencies somewhere else in your 
profile. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're, you're lacking that confidence. So what can you do? The next best thing to do, that in this order, you know, after you switch exams, the next best thing is take a course that's graded, like you can get an A, an actual grade, mm-hmm. at any accredited program. So let's say you're applying to business school. A great course to take would be accounting or statistics or finance or MBA, uh, math, math MBA, math for MBAs. And you can do this at uh, a number of University of California online programs like UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Davis all have accredited online courses you can take from anywhere. And you can do that uh, and get an A. And sh- at, or it could be the community college down the street. But the key is just to get that A or A plus in that course. Mm-hmm. Show them that demonstration of your capability. Yeah, community college is fine. It doesn't have to be a fine, you know, uh, like name brand. Yeah, yeah. Anything. Just get an A and show them that. After that, if you have, you know, if you've got A's in, you know, finance in your transcript, and you feel like you've covered off on that, but you want to do more. Um, then look at some of the ungraded pre-MBA or pre-program programs that you could do. Like there's uh, one called MBA Math. That, it's mbamath.com, and that's a highly regarded program. There's HBS Core, which is a much bigger investment, and it's almost like a little mini MBA of sorts, but you could do that. Uh, there's one called Invited MBA. There are co- co- Coursera courses you can do. The only downside with those is because they don't elicit a grade. You might pass or high pass, but, you know, it's, it's just a teeny bit less valuable if they don't have a graded course to consider. But mm-hmm. it's a great thing to do, especially if you come from a non-traditional background and want to show, like, hey, I'm really invested in this and I want to hit the ground running on some of these co- quantitative coursework concepts that I know I'm going to be working in in school. And then finally, uh, maybe the lowest option but still a good one to do is take the initiative to get your hands dirty in more quantitative or analytical projects be it at work or in your extracurriculars or community work like sign up for some Mm -hmm. project where you're helping analyze something you know for a team that needs your help so just consider ways to do that and then you can write about it in your be it in your resume essays or even your optional essay as you address your quantitative profile Right, yeah, become the treasurer for a local nonprofit or something. <laughs> I think that that's actually a great idea. A lot of it is about showing your ability to reflect on your own candidacy, um, being self-aware, and showing them that you're taking the initiative and really maximizing every opportunity and demonstrate your commitment to this process and to thriving in this very rigorous program you're about to pursue. So that's the key. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. This has been GRE Snacks, hosted by Tyler from Achievable with Hilary Schubach from Shine Admissions. And Achievable has a great online GRE course you can try for free by going to achievable.me and use the code podcast to get 10% off at checkout.